The Provoke podcast is brought to you by Provoke Media and produced by the international broadcast specialists, Mark Tears. Support for this podcast comes from Notified, the integrated, intelligent and easy to use PR software. Get a free demo today at Notified.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Provoke podcast. I'm Maya Pavinska-Sims, Provoke's EMEA editor, and I'm joined, well, I'm in chilly but sunny London today, but um, my two guests aren't. They're some way away um, in the north of the UK. I'll get them to describe where they are in a minute. First of all, we've got uh, the UK PR industry social media darling, Stephen Waddington, good friend of mine and a former director of Ketchum, Metia. Rainier and Speed, and he's now the MD of his own consultancy, Wads Inc., which helps agencies build better businesses. And Stephen's also a visiting professor at Newcastle University. Hello, Mr. Waddington, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, hello, and good morning. <laughs> We're also joined by Ralph Tench, who's a proper academic, professor of communication and director of research for Leeds Business School. And together with Stephen, Ralph has authored a new edition of the PR Bible, which is called Exploring Public Relations and Management Communication. Um, Exploring PR was originally conceived in 2005 as a collaboration between Ralph and Liz Yeomans at Leeds Beckett University. Um, It's been described as the definitive textbook on PR, blending theory and practice with critical analysis, case studies, campaigns, exercises and discussion questions. Um, Since the last edition, Liz retired and Ralph invited Stephen to create a new editorial partnership for this, the fifth edition. Ralph, welcome to the Provoke podcast. Thank you. Um, first of all, how are you both doing personally in lockdown? What have you been up to? Are you okay, Stephen? Uh, yes, kind of. Uh, lockdown three is tough, uh, tougher than what's come before. I guess the, the, the really challenging thing for me is we're, we're here sat working lockdown at home we kind of know it's getting better uh, intuitively because we hear the news about the vaccine um, um, but it doesn't necessarily feel mentally uh, any better because we haven't got a clear route out of uh, out of lockdown um, so yeah I, 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 there's that weird dissonance going on in my head that I'm trying to reconcile yeah I know exactly what you mean what about you Ralph talk to me about canoes uh, Hi, same, really same. Day to day is the, uh, is the way I'm approaching it. And I guess some things are the same, you know, lots of work, uh, lots of conversations that are still very good. They're just done from a distance. And on a personal level, I just try and keep the, the boat on an even keel by just uh, going out and cycling and running and actually recently skiing on the morn eras so nice. kind of just keep sanity by just getting outside so um i'm still enjoying everything that we're doing i just miss frankly i miss conversations well conversations like these where we are at a distance it would be nice to be able to then sit and have a coffee uh, afterwards that's probably my my big regret is that we're in a position where we don't do that at the moment so often or so frequently with people that we'd like to and particularly meeting new people but other than that surviving yeah the new, the new people thing's weird isn't it it's like those incidental conversations just aren't you know there's kind of um where you just run into somebody and have a chat I think that's kind of that's the weird thing everything is arranged as well as being on on flat screen you have you're living near Ilkley Moor and have managed to order a kayak so I think that gives us some (laughs) some insight into where there is a river I've got a moor moor to as I sit here today looking out on a snowy woodland I've got a moor to the right hand side which is my playground for the running and the bike or whatever else I do and if I look to my left there is a river down the river wharf runs down below us as well so yeah very fortunate I have to say. How oh, lovely and uh, Stephen you've been you've had uh, extracurricular projects as well isn't there a sauna <laughs> involved? Um, yeah so we converted a shed uh, into a sauna that was one of our mad uh, lockdown projects from from the first lockdown um, the, the, we've all we bought paddle my wife and I bought paddle boards and been out on the North Sea uh, from Whitley Bay, we're up in Newcastle. Um, every weekend so far, this uh, bar one so far this year. So you know that's our new thing. Yeah, I saw on your Insta, which just looks like showing. It's great off. Insta makes great Insta. <laughs> it does make great Insta, doesn't it? That's what it's all about. All over the socials, you two, as ever. Um, so tell me about the book, exploring public relations and management communication. Um, who's it for, and what does it cover? Ralph asked 
you this question first because you came up with the idea what 16 years ago i think the the principle and the ethos behind the book still lives large when i i mean i've worked in uh, education for a long time and uh, i remember when i first started and i moved over from industry where i sort of began engaging with uh, universities um, in the north of england on a part-time basis and then eventually worked full-time in, in, into the into the sector but we were dealing at that point with mainly uh, books that supported us that were either north american or were how-to books, you know, very practical books on press release writing or something similar. But there wasn't really anything that uh, spoke to students and explained to students what I would call that tricky um, element of communications and public relations, which is converting what is theory, however we articulate theory, into practice. So uh, the book that was originally conceived in conversations between Liz and I, who, um, and I was running the you know undergraduate programs and postgraduate programs at the business school at the time I could just see a huge gap and it was in my mind's eye it was always and if if you kind of bear with me with the descriptor but if you imagine it was for me it was my mind's eye was always a uh, if you think of undergraduate students a year two student who basically had some understanding of what we were talking about when we mentioned public relations they weren't completely clueless but they didn't quite get the whole picture and then it, it the book could then expand to those people that had increased knowledge on that. So it became an appeal not only for our postgraduates, because many of the chapters that we were writing, because they had theory practice um, integration, and also there were a lot of them, so we covered a lot of topics, mm. we did something that no other book had done in our field. The other thing was that when we pitched it to a variety of publishers, many of whom we had at least three offers, were the ability to actually convert it in a highly visual way because we're a visual as well as a written discipline. And I think that worked very well for many of our students. So long answer, but the, the original conception was uh, for a student, a student of the discipline. And we tried to pitch it to someone who was not you know, a complete novice, but actually was trying to learn more and know more. And I think the book has... In fact, the more we've written it and over the different iterations has probably become more and more sophisticated in the, I suppose, the intellectual challenges and the uh, some of the um, dissonances that exist in our discipline, you know, around ethics and other things that we've really had to uh, explore and challenge. So. You've got a hell of a lot of other contributors in here how did you how did you choose them have some of them been on the on the whole journey with you yeah we've got a number that have been with us from the from, from the very outset the original conception i had was to uh, work with my team at the university and we did that and that obviously that team grows and evolves people move on to other institutions and other things uh, plus then some you know like-minded others and so how I used to describe it and was anyone who got involved I did try to and always have kept a, a strong hand on friends and associates in practice because there's no point writing a conceptual book that doesn't make any sense so from the very outset we used um, case studies and examples coming from practice that really were or felt quite live and, and vibrant at the time and I think they, they really worked for our students so we started off, uh, as I've said, with, um, I suppose, people who were uh, either within the, 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 my kind of connected network or Liz's connected network and then expanded that out. And over time, we've really just probably gone to more and more specialisation, which is why I think the book quality just increases almost mm -hmm. issue by issue, because we are... Now, and you know, I, I have a lot of you know, good friends and contacts uh, in, in obviously in both academia and practice. And but the people we've got on here are seriously people who know what they're talking about. And mm -hmm. we're quite fortunate and in some ways quite privileged to have them without, how can I put this, offering to write a chapter for our book is actually really giving good service to, to the reader because these are people who are specialists in their field and they don't need to do that. They're doing it out of, they think it's a good project to be involved in. I think that's a great credit to the, to the, to the exploring brand as it were. And what were your considerations in updating the book? What, what, what's gone into the fifth edition that 
wasn't in the, the previous four? I think um, mainly, I suppose, mainly underpinning this latest review has been a requirement and a recognition. It's been going in the last edition as well, but we've seen technology run through as a kind of thematic that's kind mm. of taken for granted. But I think this time around, I very much felt we had to instruct our contributors and, and ourselves to think much more deeply about um, what are those implications going forward. So that we're not trying to write something that is future proof, but it is actually, you know, recognizing shift and change because it doesn't matter what the topic area is in every single chapter. I've, I've felt that we had to, update and, and and address the fact that society has shifted you know our media landscape is so different than it was five years ago and just keeps moving at pace now that's something that we deal with or practice deals with and then the, and the practitioner practitioner community deal with on a day-to-day -day basis what you've got to make sure is that we're teaching the next generation of students something that actually has resonance mm. and so that for me was probably the main uh, element. I mean, there are, there are others, but that was probably still an underlying factor that we had to address. And I think we then also, in the midst of all of that, you know, we deal very uh, clearly with uh, the ambiguity of uh, the role of the communicator in all of our chapters, but never more has it been uh, emphasised than the kind of issue crisis scenario that we've been thrust into in the last 18 months or so or 12 to 18 months soon will be but you know as we've drifted into a what is something that's transformed society so we had to during that process as well overlay those questions of uh, of how do we respond when we have a substantive change yeah. we did something similar but at a much smaller scale in one of the earlier editions after the 2008 financial crisis which was to ask about how does this affect you know, the economic shifts and economic um, icebergs that kind of stop us, how do they affect communication? So we asked that, but in a much smaller way. Obviously, the pandemic of COVID is very different from that. And Stephen, as the, the you know, the co-author and the and the latest editor of this edition, what, what did you want to bring to it? So um, the, um, the, the so, so, uh, early conversations with with Ralph about this about three years ago uh, and it was the opportunity to bring theory and practice to together and and explore is a very special book because of that um you know it, it's rooted in solid scholarly endeavor but then also is brought to life through every single page with um with um thinking design around case studies Call outs for, for, for to, to, to contemporary practice, you know, um, invitations to, to students and anyone in practice to think about, um, you know, where where practice going. So, so it, you know, it's a living um, living piece of work. Um, but but for me, it was the the community, sense of community, the community of practice, bringing together theory and practice. Because you know, within the best best will in the world, there's you know, there's, there's Public relations, um, you know, is studied within universities. There's a big academic uh, community doing brilliant work, um, th but, but the engagement then with practice has been in the past limited. And I, I was very keen to, as I have been for the last, you know, last five or six years, uh, to bring those two communities close together. And how has uh, I'll ask you both this, but. Um... Ralph, I'll come to you first. How has public relations education and, and the qualifications in this area evolved and changed over um, the past, you know, 20 years or so, and particularly over the past 15 since the first edition came out? I think we've probably seen uh, evolution in, in terms of the understanding of, obviously, the discipline and the education of the discipline. So what that's meant is we've we started off and when I was very first involved in education, we were mainly dealing with undergraduate students. And then we, uh, in Leeds, we um, wrote the first C CIPR or IPR as well as CIPR diploma. And we've seen the kind of training and development requirements, um, aspirations, expectations coming from our practitioners as well, mm -hmm. which has then led into uh, more postgraduate level of uh, study and qualifications so master's qualifications 
uh, and increasingly students who want to study on um, uh, further further studies in, in terms of doctorates, whether that's as a, a DBA in comms or a, a PhD in comms. Right. But we've seen all of this evolve. So in other words, I guess, you know, we started off at a fairly uh, rudimentary level of just training the entrance and then have seen education become more ingrained in people's aspirations and expectations and recognition that there is something to be learned about a discipline that uh, many of us who started in the communications field, like exactly like myself who are a certain age we started off as news reporters rather than as trained pr people uh, moved over from journalism into pr and you know we we learn on the hoof now we we can do so much more than that and those intuitive understandings we had about our skills as uh, wordsmiths and crafters of stories were actually one part of that process but you don't uh, necessarily as a journalist get trained in understanding strategy and strategic direction and communications engagement with organizations and businesses and bringing those things together. So these are sort of <clears throat> the elements that have become more and more well-known and more, more, in a way more sophisticated through time and analysis of what, we, uh, what we've been able to teach. So uh, I don't know if that answers entirely what you were asking me, but it, it's, it's my perception of how it's going. I guess wrapping it up with an increasingly sophisticated landscape of offer but also a more sophisticated um, uh, student of, of the discipline as well. Stephen, as a practitioner, what would you add to that in terms of how you've seen PR education um, evolve? Um, I think two answers to that. The first is many practitioners, as Ralph had described, have, have come into practice through um through th from other from other routes other than you know um, public relations education journalism is a common route um, that's how I came into the industry myself uh, and have you know retrospit retrofitted an educational background in public relations on on the back of that and I think you know the, the changes in the industry particularly over the last five to ten years. Um, you know, the acceleration of technology, the changing media landscape has meant that learning has very firmly had to become part of practice, continuing learning, continuous learning has to become, has had to become part of practice. The second point is the the, the point about professionalism of, of our industry and the increasing professionalism. She's on the agenda of all, you know, uh, many organizations, especially the trade associations and the professional associations, in that you know, public relations seeks to be part of bouldering conversations. It seeks to measure itself against other professional disciplines and be afforded the value that, for example, legal and finance are. Um, but what it doesn't do, what it's not done, is necessarily measure itself against the barriers of entry that there might be to legal or finance and the continuous learning that's Part of that, and I think that's something that is certainly changed in the changed in the last five years, and long may it continue. So, Ralph, what are the challenges for you um, of ensuring PR degrees are fit for purpose and for this future professionalism? I, I'm guessing linking theory and the reality of a constantly evolving practice is, is one of those challenges. That's one of the challenges. I think also um, it is interlinking. What I suppose I would add to what I was saying earlier is where we've evolved is we do have, I mean, Stephen's alluded to it, we do have a more sophisticated, not just in the UK, but worldwide, a body of, uh, I call them academics, the people who are studying public relations. We And we know much more about it from a uh, from a perspective of being studied. And there are, there are these research projects, initiatives that are really having, for me, an impact because they're asking questions about us and what we do and helping to reflect upon the practice. So they're important for students because they help us to sort of benchmark, as we do in other disciplines, as, as we've alluded to, in other professional disciplines, that's exactly what happens, you know, in in human resource management, you know, they do want to know more about leadership, but there's no, you, you only get to know more about leadership by studying leadership and then applying those studies and understanding. And we're the same, you know, we, we are no different. I know there are some naysayers who say, we just go out and do it, but actually just doing it is not enough. We need to stop and think. And one of the sort of educational principles that we still live by and, and, 
absolutely apply in all of our um, delivery is around encouraging uh, the, the delegate student to actually stop and think and reflect. And that's what education does. It's that moment of time where you think about a theoretical principle or something that is a concept that you apply, but then think about that, take time rather than rushing with that. You have to consider what that means and what are the implications of taking one route or another route, which is why sometimes taking, you know, in the same way, strategic uh, analysis can allow you to look at a problem and say, well, if I looked at it in this way, it would lead into those uh, outcomes. And if I looked at it from this perspective, it might lead to different outcomes. So they're, they're for me, the, 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 the important things. And the challenges are always, in a way, with many of our students, are to encourage them to do that and to not stop them from being innovative and creative. We absolutely are um, engendering that in all of our students. If you look at the way that we teach our courses and how we encourage that type of um, output and, and creativity. But you don't want to do that without having thought about the issue in depth first and applied some principles to why you're going to go and take the actions and the action orientated approach that you might wish to do. So for me, that's been you know, one of the things that we've um, built on and uh, developed. And I think exploring, I hope, does that. You know, it encourages this level of understanding all of the, the fields or the concepts and the, the subject areas that we cover with a degree of stop and think and then plan and then action so that we uh, we put those principles into our into our delegates and our students or whatever whether at practitioner professional level or whether in um, undergraduates or postgraduates and just in terms of diversity Stephen I'm going to direct this question at you how do we get young people from different backgrounds and the smartest young people to study PR to to do these degrees to see the industry as an exciting choice of career and that's a really tough question, and you know it's a, a it's an issue that's facing and uh, you know organisations like the PRCA and ECO, where there's a lot of thinking around that. And I think um, I, I think twofold um, hold up examples of, of best practice and excellence and show the potential of a career in public relations, but then also you know engagement with. Uh, the career level with with schools you know I've got a 14 year old son who's thinking about you know what what where he might go from GCSE to, to A levels and you know starting to have those thoughts about um about what he wants to do in his career and we're having those conversations and you know you're damn sure that public relations is, isn't something he's, he's thinking about just because he's not aware of it um and, and um, you know, despite his father's best efforts. Um, yeah, you so need to sort that out, Stephen. Seriously, if your <laughs> son's not thinking about PR as a career option. Uh, in jest, he, <laughs> at the school level, though, there needs to be, you know, yeah. community and grassroots engagement by our, by our profession. Um, I think the final chapter of the book, just coming back to, to your oeuvre, uh, it's probably the most interesting. And I think it's one of those one of those bits of a book that should probably be read by everyone in the industry, not just students and, and newbies. And that's on future issues for PR and strategic communications. What were some of the standout themes here that you identified? Because you two kind of co-authored this last chapter together. What were you absolutely passionate about including in here? Shall I go first on that? So, yeah. so um, the really interesting thing about the book and what I read, what I learned by working with uh, Ralph is, you know, you don't have to come up with answers necessarily. What you're doing is uh, describing a situation and leaving it for, especially in this last chapter, leaving it for, for students and practitioners to then take away those topics and and develop and you know it was a substantive piece of work that last the last chapter we explored you know a whole series of different issues uh, in fact we rewrote as we did many parts of the uh, many parts of the book because of the covid crisis we, the book was both delayed going through publication but then we took the opportunity as well to to take some time out to reflect on what the implications of COVID-19 might be for practice so that's a big section um you know what, what we, we've seen public relations elevated as a discipline 
through the crisis because organizations have sought out professional communicators not only to listen and understand um, stakeholder environments but then to engage with them so that for me is first and foremost the big one the second one is the issue of um, uh, of media disinformation and and the rise of Facebook Google uh, and these networks in acting as a media disintermediator um, uh, and uh, and the power that they have around um, around you know managing a media environment media sphere and I think I can't help but think personally my view is there has to be some sort of regulation coming uh, around these networks because they're just so large they're too big to, to fail now um, um, so that's the second one. And the final one is is artificial intelligence for me. Um, you know, there's been a lot of talk in our industry and Mayor and you and I have debated this, the fact that, you know, it is one of those bright, shiny objects. Clearly, uh, tools and automation are helping practitioners work smarter and do a better job. But, you know, we're not going to see uh, a whole bunch of, of roles swept out as we originally maybe thought in, in public relations because of because of artificial intelligence. So those are my three favourite areas. Ralph, you're going to have others, um, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, I could sort of overlay on a number of those. I think it, to wrap around all of that, I think we have, you've asked the question about the uh, profession and, and its diversity issues around gender that they are, they are and continue to be themes that we've looked at and we're exploring in other projects with partners who were involved in the book and things that we've both been involved in in those areas but the big one for me I think that wraps around all of that as we I mean I was thinking the same answers really big ones on misinformation big ones on uh, evolving AI but what all of these represent is a little bit like the question of the, you know, the 14 year old, uh, one of us, me, you, you or Stephen's son, is the question of what actual skills and competencies do we need to be a practitioner of the future? And I think this is something that, you know, in other research projects I'm involved with, we look at the kind of trending of the practice. I do the European Communication Monitor now for 15 years, where we've measured and tracked and looked at the practice each year but also look to the future and one of the things that I think is a uh, an ongoing challenge is knowing and understanding um, what those skills might be what those competencies might, might be and many are static but some are changing and I think we have and I've particularly seen shifts in capabilities which going back to the question Maya, you asked around how do we attract people I think we've got to show several things one is we've got to be much more proud of what we do and also more professional and that professionalization agenda is based around giving young people the aspiration to join a field of practice that is recognized has a professional set of skills uh, you are encouraged to do it because you can learn about it you can study it and therefore it has credibility a bit like doing law or some other surveying or nursing there's a body of knowledge because otherwise why would young people go into it if it's not something that's got those kind of hallmarks of credibility and something that you would aspirationally be able to acquire now what that also means is i think we've seen shifts and changes so going back to what we were talking about earlier from the likes of me who drift and Stephen maybe similarly we drifted from other vocational areas because we were able to do one particular skill set for me I was originally recruited because I was a uh, I worked on national newspapers and could copyright mm. now that's that's one skill now we're looking at people who can manage data who are more numerate who are you know and these are skills that are highly valued and people will pay a lot of money for in in, in some fields of practice so we've got to elevate those aspects of what we need to be able to do and show that we are high performers in those areas and therefore add value to organizations whether in a profit or not-for-profit setting that they really matter so I think that's something that for me the future when when we were pulling that all together that overlaid it was really recognizing that we are seeing and evolving the new the new practitioner you know for the future. And Ralph, tell me about some of those new skills that are emerging. Are there any surprises for you? 
Uh, no, there aren't any surprises. I think the only one that I suppose the only one that I suppose having taught the subject for a long, long time, I can remember days when when I, I teach out of a business school, and I'm very unashamed of that. And therefore, we've always taught uh, what, what at various points has been uh, accounting for, for public relations for public relations, essentially, you might call it. And when I first uh, began to teach, I used to get a lot, and I bring my accounting colleagues in. I used to get quite a lot of resistance from our students because they were like saying, well, why on earth are we learning accounting? We want to learn copywriting, media relations, how, how to make a video or whatever it might be. And I used to insist, no, no, you need to know this. If you can't add up and take away, you know, and work on your account, then, uh, or you're working in an organisation, you will always be on some sort of budgetary position and you'll have more credibility if you can follow the numbers. And I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had from ex-alumni or alumni who, who talk to me about, and they now might be running their own business, they're, or they're working in large corporates, or they are CEO of a, of a, of a big group of uh, agencies. All of these are actual cases. Who said, thank goodness we did something on numbers? <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's not that these things are new. It's just that I think we're now seeing that that, particularly for data management, is probably the one that I most have seen in some of our high-performing uh, um, departments or organisations that really are doing comms well. They're managing information in a very sophisticated way. So students and, and young people who are studying in all disciplines these days of social sciences will probably at some level be asked to understand data management, you know, the, the research methodology of data and how to understand data. But that's becoming more, I think, more prominent and I think something that uh, is a is a great opportunity actually for the, for new generations to get involved in that because they can differentiate and, and show their contribution and uh, most organisations recognise that that if you can show value somehow by understanding you know the impact of what you're doing the measurable effect then I think they are in a better place so that to me is one of the ones that I think um, we could do more and make more of in the future. And Stephen, you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, talking about the future, there's a whole chapter, well, it's your postscript really, release, recovery and reform from, from COVID, bring the book bang up to date. What's your thinking from everything you're seeing about where the industry goes after this time? Um, so yeah, I'm naturally optimistic. That's part of my personality. But then I, I you know, I genuinely am. I did a piece of work. Um, during the first lockdown for the government communication service in the UK, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the profession and how we'd responded as practitioners. And every story, I spoke to you know 20 odd um, FTSE comms directors, public affairs directors, and every story I heard was of resilience, uh, uh, innovation, and, and, you know, an elevation of, 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 practice um you know if if an organization didn't have uh, comms pr um, public affairs at represented at board level before the crisis and that's that's both in the public and the private sector it certainly does now um because of this need for organizations to listen uh to their various stakeholders not least their employees you know who are, are now dispersed uh, working from home uh, and then to be able to engage with them and you know in that sense public relations has become part of a leadership and, and you know productivity function uh, as much as anything so you know we, we've got this huge huge uh, stimulus well COVID-19 has acted as a huge stimulus on the profession I know very firmly 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 believe that and I hope you know coming out of it um, we build on that now that's not to say you know there are aspects of the profession that have you know been uh, that have lent into to areas um, that have been most affected by COVID-19 such as culture such as arts hospitality and travel that you know like every aspect of those markets have been you know been devastated but there are also you know incredible stories from from public service and public sector mm -hmm. uh, and and as i say you know organizations where public uh, public relations communicators have, have absolutely come to the fore and elevated the profession as a result and how Stephen, i'll stay with you how is how is the new business going are you loving doing your own thing you seem to be picking up non-exec roles all over the place for 
for really exciting young businesses? So, I, you know what? I spotted an opportunity. So, in the middle of last year, spotted. And I was having lots of conversations as we all were in in lockdown um, about how the industry might be changing. And spotted, as you did, you know, this huge energy around. Um, practitioners starting new agencies and new you know agencies pivoting and, and doing very different things i had there is a tremendous energy in the independent agency market at the moment uh, and so yeah i set up a professional advisory service helping those those businesses and yes it's been incredibly well received um, you know organizations um, agencies seeking help with with business models, with propositions, with with marketing, um, and and looking to come out to 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 uh, to market, uh, you know, and and that's around areas of practice. It's around innovation. Uh, it's around new forms of media such as such as voice, uh, and you know, it's one of the hugely exciting opportunities emerging from. Uh, emerging from COVID, and I just thank my lucky stars I spotted the opportunity and I'm digging into it. And yes, it's going incredibly well. I'm so glad things are going well. Um, guys, uh, what's finally one habit you've started in lockdown that you hope to continue as life gets back to some sort of normality? Ralph, I'm going to come to you on that one first. 15 minutes with Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll come back. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I think, uh, as Stephen will know, I'm kind of quite keen on uh, my sport and exercise as a way of keeping myself sane. So I do ride my bike uh, both off-road and on-road uh, a lot and, uh, and uh, used to commute into Leeds. And one of the things I'm missing most is my sort of 35-mile round trip to work and back because uh, it's a way of keeping fit so one of the things I have introduced which I never thought I would because I'm actually a I'm an old school road cyclist who's always been on the road but I have taken to Zwifting which is oh. you know the uh, the online virtual world of, uh, of of training on a on an indoor trainer which I was a slight reluctant convert to I've got a load of my friends who who race on Zwift and all sorts of stuff and I've always kind of slightly poo-pooed it but I have to say since January and the, when the ice came and the snow I I've had to go I've, I've had a train over years but I've gone on it with some gusto because there was no option because it was a bit too health and safety was not going to allow me or rather my wife's health and safety uh uh, measures we're not going to allow me to go on the road in the ice again but um so yeah i've taken to that and I, i'm um i'm a relative convert i'll see when the sun shines and it's a, a june day in in north yorkshire whether i'm still on the zwift but no i think i will because i think you can feel there's a ways of it it's highly competitive it allows you to really train hard so i'm probably gaining fitness not losing fitness in these months where sometimes over the winter you lose it so i think yeah for me it would be online sadly as it is online exercise <laughs> on a turbo but uh yeah it's been fun it's online um well good for you i'm glad it's i'm glad it's working we all need to do what we need to do to to keep sane Stephen, what about you lots of cocktails so we, made in your household <laughs> so ralph and i did we we had a, a the final editorial meeting when we were talking about marketing we were so fed up with zooms that we uh, within the government's strict life guidelines uh, at the time uh, headed to the Yorkshire Moors and uh, we had a great day didn't we we did about mm -hmm. 12 50 mile walk um, um, where we you know thrashed out the uh, and, and put, a, put the world to rights at the same time uh, and had a great day out walking in the hills the only thing was obviously there were no pubs open so we weren't able to go and get go and get dinner and have a drink afterwards so that was that was a highlight actually of the book uh, and the whole process so i built a sauna during uh, during the first lockdown in a shed converted a shed into a sauna which was uh, is a huge thing on on insta uh, shed saunas go and check <laughs> that out uh, and and ralph uh, ralph's been winding me up with with he's he's a great camper van fanatic and i've just got complete camper van envy so um the latest stage of this project and ralph doesn't know this yet is that i'm now thinking about having done this done the sort of whether i i buy a van and and fit that out myself or or the negotiation is ongoing with mrs waddington about whether we buy uh, a camper van outright mm. 
Oh, well, good luck. Good luck with those negotiations. I have uh, I have some insight into how those will go. But <laughs> enjoy the new project. Um, both, thank you so much for joining me on the pod today. Well done. It's it's quite a hefty it's quite a hefty volume. Recommended reading and um, to to dip in and out of for anyone at any stage of their career. I would I would suggest it's it's running to well over six hundred pages. So um, go and grab your copy. And thank you both so much for joining me. Take care out there. You have been listening to the Provoke podcast, brought to you by Provoke Media and produced by the international broadcast specialists, Marketeers. Support for this podcast comes from Notified, the integrated, intelligent and easy-to-use PR software. Get a free demo today at notified.com.